All right, and we are live. Awesome. Well, Glenn, thanks for coming on and talking with me. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Tom. Thanks for getting in touch. So you're a pastor in Eastbourne. How long have you been a pastor? Uh, uh, I was ordained in 2007. I've been working for churches since 2000. Uh, I, I don't have a church of my own. I, I work for a charity that frees me up to go around a lot of different places. Um, so, uh, yeah, but uh, I'm still an ordained minister in the Church of England, and uh, yeah, my day job is basically talking to people about Jesus. Cool, cool. So I heard about you from your unbelievable video where you did the speech about the given with an atheist. Was that based on a real conversation or many conversations you've had with atheists? Yeah, no, there was a, there was a conversation with a guy uh, at Oxford, so I was uh, speaking at a lunchtime, uh, a lunchtime talk there, and uh, yeah, and he just kept on using the word, the word given, and of course he, you know, he, by given, he meant a sort of an axiomatic a priori belief. Um, you know, the, the first given that he started talking to me about was uh, empiricism. We, you know, empiricism is just a given. Um, and away we went, and, uh, and then he used the word given uh, to apply to um, sort of objective morality when we started talking about Old Testament practices and things like that. And so he just, he just kept saying given a lot, and, and yeah, it got, me, it got me thinking, and that was probably more than three years ago now, probably three or four years ago. And then when Justin asked, could I do a poem for the conference? Um, I guess, yeah, it all just sort of tumbled out of me um, as a poem. And I, so from one perspective, it took me an afternoon to write. From another perspective, it took me, it took me about three years to write, but yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. I really, I really enjoyed it. It was a really engaging way to convey a point. And I, I, I'm trying to learn a lot from it because I want to be a public speaker myself. So I think it was really cool. And I, Congratulate you for it. Oh well, thank you. You know, it can it can come across as snarky. You know, it's it's very it's very easy to, you know, come up with a, uh, you know, a, a straw man and you know shadow box with with a straw man. Um, so it can come up come across that way, and I, I understand people who have reacted to it in that in that way. But uh, but I also think you know the mind is not just a debating chamber. I think the mind is a is a picture gallery, and I think. Um, trying to communicate with evocative language and, and that sort of thing is it has its place. So yeah, I try to fly a flag for that as well. Well, I hope our conversation will give you some more cool material for another such uh, poem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to start, I am an atheist, by which I mean I don't believe there is any reason or evidence or argument that indicate the existence of a god, and I imagine that you do. And so, would you tell me some of the reasons that you believe there are for believing in a god, and then I'll tell you why I don't find those compelling, and then i just like to hear your thoughts on my position. Okay, okay. And so when you, when you say that, uh, is that, is that to assume that the non-existence of God is, is, is the, sort of the default, the, the null hypothesis? Is that, is that your position, that the burden of proof is on the, the believer in God? Is that as an atheist, As an atheist, I lack belief in a God, so I don't assume there is no God. There could be, but I don't think there's any reason to believe in one. Okay, so this could be a godless universe, or it could be the 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 contingent kind of outflowing of a source of all being called God. Um, you're undecided on that, but okay, okay, cool. Well, I mean, why why do I think um, there's a God? Well, you know, here we are having a conversation to rational minds using language and rhetoric and emotion and reason and all these kind of immaterial realities uh, to minds using metaphysics and uh, speaking in, in ways that concern morality, speak in ways that uh, concern uh, logic and all, all kinds of things. And, and what I notice about all of that is that these are immaterial values. Um, and so to my mind, I think what, what stands closest to my experience of the world is something a lot more like God than a godless universe. So, you know, if, if, if there are only two options and there are far more than two options, but if there were only two options, I would say that, um, if there's a godless universe on, on the one hand, and there is a, a universe that is the, the creation of a, of a God who intends us to know him, I would say that my experience of the world, even just minute by minute, um, is much better explained by the God hypothesis, so to speak. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of, um, that's where I often begin because I think it's closest to our experience of the world. Our, our, our phenomenological experience of the world is a conscious one um, and it involves these immaterial realities, minds that are considering metaphysics. And, you know, and so, you know, my line is often that, that even if you were to be a, a materialist, what, what do you notice about materialism? It, it is, a, it is um, a worldview that exists within minds. It is itself something um, that is immaterial. Uh, and, and therefore, I, I find that explanation for reality um, the most unimpressive um of all of all of them actually so yeah should we begin there sure that sounds good so you mentioned rationality morality uh intelligibility uh couldn't all those things be explained by undiscovered super laws of nature or some part of nature that we just haven't don't understand yet why would that necessarily be indicative of a god or a supernatural or a spiritual realm when you say laws um what do you have in mind well, just there could be lots of stuff about the universe we don't know or we don't understand yet. Like, for example, take morality. There could just be a super moral law of nature that imposes on us kind of like gravity does, and that's where we get our moral values from. Right. And I, and I think at, at that stage, we're, we're starting to talk in terms that sound a lot more theological to my ears anyway, that, that we've got um, not just molecules in motion, but we've got this moral domain. Um, which again is this is this immaterial thing, and and even as you talk in terms of laws, um, um, do you mean laws? I mean, do you, do you think that quarks and leptons are obeying something in the universe? Um, is 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 there something that is over and above the material universe that is imposing itself on the material universe? Because again, that sounds like a a much more like a theological claim to my ears. Uh, I would describe it as saying that it's a description of how the universe operates. So instead of theism, this could be like pantheism, where it's just an eternal, all-powerful universe, and it has laws, moral laws, kind of like uh, gravity would be a law that imposes on us. There could be a moral law that works in a similar way, a physical moral law. And it just happens to interact in our brains in such a way that causes us to feel moral inclinations. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, and, and at that stage, I think uh, morality very much uh, refers to persons. Um, I think if it was just a, a universe of just rocks and, and helium, um, I, I, I don't think it would be a moral domain. So it, so it is interesting to me that um, we want to navigate this world, not only uh, ascribing to this universe certain laws, which is an interesting way of, you know, of, of characterizing the regularity of this world, um, I, I think it happens to be, again, quite a theological way of conceiving of things that there are, you know, because you could just talk about regularities, but to talk about laws almost implies a lawgiver. And I think to, to bring that into the moral domain as well, we want to navigate this world as though there, there are these moral truths, these moral facts out there, but moral truths and moral facts concern persons. And again, we're starting to talk about a universe that doesn't, to my mind, sound, it doesn't sound mechanical at that point, you know? It sounds, it doesn't sound like a godless universe. If we start, if we start to recognize that there are moral, these immaterial moral facts that, that are binding on people, um, if you see what I mean. So let me ask it to you this way. What, what is it about a theistic based morality that makes it objective? Why is a God morality objective? Well, I, I think there is a personal God and this personal God has um, desires. This personal God has uh, wishes for the universe and wishes for his creatures. Um, and, and therefore, there is not just um, healthy and unhealthy, there is also just and unjust, there is also good and evil. Um, because we live in a personal domain created by a personal God, I think that therefore means that we don't just navigate this world in space and time, but there are other dimensions, things like good and evil, just and unjust. So, so it, essentially it comes from God's nature, is that about what you're saying? Would that be a fair representation? Sure, I th yeah, I, th I think 
you know, the, the, the Euthyphro kind of dilemma, you know, back, back in the day would, would think of, you know, does, does God or do the gods say things that, you know, that things are good because they are good and he must recognize them to be good. Or does he just, you know, by diktats say that they are good and therefore they become good because of those, those things. And I think the Christian position is, is to kind of um, say the, the answer to those two questions is yes, that actually God is all goodness. Um, that there is not a standard outside of God's that God must live up to in order to be good himself, but that God is good and he is yeah. So could God command you to do something immoral? Um, no. No, by the nature of the case, no. So his commands are limited by his nature, and so his commands are really just an expression of God's nature? Is that about right? He commands what he wants. You know, our, our God is in heaven. He does what he pleases. It's Psalm 115, verse 3. Um, so it's an expression of his freedom uh, for him to do the good, choose the good, be the good. But he couldn't command us to do something immoral? No, the, the Bible says God cannot lie, for instance. Uh, yeah. So it seems to me that God's commands seem to be limited by his nature, which is goodness. So he couldn't command us to do something immoral or because he wouldn't want us to inherently do to his nature. Well, I, th I think we, we tend to think of freedom in terms of infinite options, um, but I, th I don't think God would be more free if he did evil, because I think the the, the, by the nature of the case, to do evil, to, to not do the good is not to make yourself more free. And to be able to not do the good does not make you more free. Um, but uh, evil is a degradation of the good. It is uh, a privation of the good, as, as Augustine called it. Therefore, for, God's, for God to choose evil is not for him to be able to be more free, because such a choice would would make him less free if he were to do it. Okay, so from my perspective, it seems like God's commands are just an expression of his nature when his nature is really what the goodness is, and you don't really need the commands at all. They just seem to be expressions of the God's inherent nature. So what good do the commands actually do? Because if they're limited by the nature, then they seem kind of redundant. Uh, well, so I don't, I don't ground my morality simply in the commands of God. Um, it's, you know, and it's not because there's a Bible that I think there are objective mo morals. I think, I think it's because we live in a moral universe created by a moral being. That's, that's where I think morality comes from. So, you know, what use are the commands? Um, well, we need to, we need to know. Um, and I don't, I don't think, you know, his commands in scripture are the only ways that we could ever know what good and evil is, right and wrong is. Uh, but if he wants to communicate to his beloved creatures, then um, then for him to express that in Revelation would be an obvious and loving thing to do. Okay. So from my perspective, it seems like uh, instead of theism, you could equally have an objective morality grounded in pantheism or deism or polytheism or transtheism, all these other kinds of theisms. Like pantheism is my favorite. It's just the an eternal, all-powerful universe kind of thing. And there's just more laws to it that are grounded in its nature rather than God's nature. And it can also have that kind of morality, which is conveyed to us not through commands, but through laws of nature. So, so why would that be less plausible a view of morality than a theistic view of morality? I would say, I mean, two, two things um, spring to mind. One is the freedom of such a God to be above and beyond the world. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to panentheistic claims that, that all things are in God, um, which, which can be quite, sound quite similar to pantheistic claims. But uh, a, a lot of Christian theologians have noticed that in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul quotes approvingly from one of the Greeks when he says, in God we live and move and have our being. And so um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to panentheists who say that all things are in God. But I think even those panentheists would say that um, God is above and beyond and before um, such a world, such that the world does not constrain God. Um, so the freedom of God I'd worry about, and, and then the, the personal nature of God. Um, within the doctrine of the Trinity, we have 
an intensely personal and irreducibly personal doctrine of God. We've got Father, loving Son, in the joy of the Holy Spirit, such that before and behind and beneath and beyond this world, there is love, and we've come from that personal love. Um, so to have a sub-Trinitarian doctrine of God, I would worry that you would actually lose uh, the love that is at the heart of morality. Um, you know, Jesus defines morality as love God and love neighbor. But I think actually the doctrine of the Trinity gives you um, personal love from before the world began. Um, and, and therefore, there, there is a grounding for a personal loving morality, um, not, not just having moral categories in the abstract. That's interesting. I don't, I'm not sure if I see uh, why that would be necessary for morality. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be sufficient to have just an objective ground or basis of morality like a super law? Does it need to be personal for some reason? Well, the moral domain is a personal domain, isn't it? So it, it would be hard to think of morality in, in impersonal terms, I would say. Um, may, but maybe, maybe that is just the way we tend to think of morality uh, in the West. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it is our Christian heritage that makes us supremely sensitive to the personal. Um, because, uh, because you're right. Um, for instance, the, the karmic religions um, don't, don't tend to have the same primacy of, of, of the personal when it comes to, to moral questions. And, um, so that is interesting, but I, I, I would say that I think we, we lose something if we are not intensely personal in, uh, in the moral disposition we have towards others, that it, it is because I think of you as in the image of God. It's because I think of you as my neighbor who is to be loved with the very love that God has given me. I think my, my morality certainly boils down to, to something very intensely personal, but I could, I could understand a morality that didn't necessarily um, have that kind of moral uh, personal framework. Yeah, so from my perspective, I totally agree. I think the personal aspect of morality is incredibly important when it has to do with individuals, but I think that that personhood can come from a source that isn't itself personal. It's kind of like an emergent property, like no amount of hydrogen and oxygen atoms contain the property of ocean, but if you put enough of them together, you can get an ocean. So morality can come from something that isn't personal and have personal effects to the people who experience it. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the mechanism for that happening, you would say, would be Darwinian evolution over the 3.5 billion years of human evolution that, like what, what, what is, how does that emerge, would you say? Well, I'd say that's just a, a physical super law, kind of like gravity that just permeates the universe. Okay. Just an un undiscovered super law that could exist that we haven't discovered yet. That would be a possibility. Okay. And what would, what would be the, if, if the content of that law could be articulated, what, what do you think it would be? Well, I would say it would probably be a description of the best of all possible worlds for all possible wills. That would be what it would be. Okay. And wills, is i mean there's a personal center of consciousness going on with a will so so that would that would be it'd be personal to that degree wouldn't it oh absolutely i think it definitely affects persons it it has the moral personhood of affecting the the people in the universe but i don't think it comes from a person okay okay and it is it has emerged So a, a, a universe that does not care for you has somehow become a universe that does care for persons? Well, I'll just, I would assume it would be just a law that has always been in the universe like gravity. It's just a part of the universe, a part of its intrinsic nature. So do you, do you believe there's a kind of a teleology to the universe itself, that the, that the universe has had something like us in mind in order for, for that to happen? Uh, no, I just think we're just a result of the way nature is. Okay. Well, it seems like there's two different uses of law going on then, because if law for gravity is a description of the regularities that we can observe, um, it would seem like law realm would have had to have waited a heck of a long time until there were moral agents in the world 
in order f- and and then it does it just does it just describe the the best kind of flourishing for 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 wills in the world or did, did, would would you say that law when it comes to gravity and law when it comes to morality is a kind of an a, equivalent use of that term Oh, yeah, I'm expanding it to say there is an actual physical thing, like a physical wave or particle that is the moral particle out there that we just haven't discovered yet. And though, so more than a law, an an actual quality, an actual would you just, would you say even substance within yes. the world? Yes. Yes. Right. 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 And and would you like? Do you do you go in that kind of direction when it comes to consciousness as well? In terms of sort of panpsychism, sort of that sort of idea that maybe there's a that maybe there's a conscious sort of element to all matter, and that's why we get to consciousness. Or I'm, I might have jumped the shark totally there. Oh, well, I think it's a possibility. I think that we can think of there's lots of parts of nature we don't know about, and of those parts, all the things we don't know about, like morality and consciousness and rationality, could emerge from physical processes and physical existing particles we just haven't discovered. Personally, for consciousness, I think that's just an emergent property of the brain. I don't think there is actually a soul, but it, it could be. It's another possibility. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, but with so, but that's interesting. With with morality, so it's more than you're you're saying it's more than a law. There there is a kind of a if if you're leaning towards pantheism, then then there is this this god woven into the cosmos, um, and the and the way we respond to such a god is is by living ethically. I don't know how how would you characterize that that kind of relationship. Well, with pantheism, what I mean is just an eternal, all powerful universe. No consciousness, no personality intrinsic to it. It's just a, just a universe, just a natural universe, or maybe some supernatural things too, maybe, but just no consciousness. It's just the universe. So it's not exactly a god, or I mean, you could call it a god, I guess, if you wanted to. Yeah, I was just, I was just, you know, hanging off the the theism part of pantheism. Okay, so 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 we're not really pantheism then, but pan pan ethos kind of uh yeah okay well I, I just uh because i understand pantheism to be like uh einstein and spinoza used the term pantheism a lot they just believed in the universe and that god was in a sense just the the functioning of the universe so that's where i'm getting that from mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah and I, I would say they were they were both i guess einstein with uh the laws of nature and, and Spinoza with things like consciousness were noticing things about the world and and realizing that a strict materialism just just couldn't really account for life in all its domains life in all its dimensions um, and I yeah and and for me it, it just seems like pressing into for instance the the moral domain that um, that love really does seem to be um, what we consider to be the highest ideal. You know, today's a good day if when you, your head hits the pillow, you've had good interactions with people, you've had good connection. There's been a kind of a person to person, face to face, perhaps. Um, love makes the day a good day. Disconnection, unlovingness, um, relational breakdown makes the world. A hell of a world, um, and therefore I, I kind of say that an ethical domain to this world is not simply is not simply about uh, mere duties, but a kind of a a going with the grain of love. Um, and so, f- so for me, it seems like this moral domain that that suffuses the the, the universe. Um, is a more personal, conscious, loving reality. And that, that seems to me more to reflect those moral intuitions that, that I began the conversation with. Well, from my perspective, if morality really was from a personal source, it would seem like that personal source would have created the most moral world possible and there wouldn't be all of this suffering. So it seems more likely to me that it was just uh, like a super law like gravity that tends to 
make us inclined towards one certain outcome, but it didn't actually give us that. Because if it did, why wouldn't it have just made the most perfect world from the start? Mm. Yeah, and, and you know, and I guess Spinoza's you know comeback was, I guess this must be the best of all possible worlds, um, which is not the that's not the direction that I take things in, but I I, I tend to think our experience of this world in all its uh, ugliness and pain and horror um, is exactly a, an experience of fallenness um, that every evil we experience is a privation of the good and therefore it seems to speak of the kind of story that the bible has that that we began with goodness and we have fallen into this hell of a pit um that's not obviously the end of the story if if god this most loving being um is to continue to love his creation then he's going to want to enter into the pit to redeem us and, and bring us to the best of all possible worlds but i don't i I don't think we have any reason for thinking that there can't be a good reason for God to allow a fall if indeed his intention is to redeem and bring us to the happily ever after. So that's that's some of the shape of of my response to the, the, the question of evil and theodicy and that sort of thing. I, I don't know what your reaction to that is. So from my perspective, I think that if there was an all-good, all-powerful God, he would have created a world where each individual gets to decide for themselves both the positives and the negatives of the world in which they live. And in a world like that, any benefit or any reason God may have for making a fallen world would just be optional. So we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't force us against our will into this world. He would give us the option, and that would seem to be a more morally superior way the world could have been. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's always difficult by the nature of the case um, to say what God could have and should have done um, in, in these sorts of situations. But I do find it interesting that I think we have millions of experiments where people try to tell stories that are meaningful stories that, that sort of resonate with the human heart. And in none of these stories does it go, you know, once upon a time there was a kingdom of light and life and love and everyone was happy, the end. Um, you know, I've got a three-year-old daughter and I tell that story to her and she says, that's not how stories go. And she's right. Stories, you know, there's a kingdom of light and life and love. And then the dragon comes and steals the, the princess. And then, you know, the, the knight has got to go and save her and, you know, go, go through sacrifice and, a you know, a fight to the death and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. And, and then there's a happily ever after. And I, I just think... Um, we do have experience of trying to speak worlds into existence. It's called storytelling, um, novel writing, plays, cinema. Um, and in all these stories that we tell, we, we do tend to have um, a, a happy beginning, a fall, a hero, uh, fight to the death, and a, and a, and a happily ever after. And I, um, you know, that's, that's not a, a, a watertight philosophical argument, but it is pointing to the fact that, that when we do run the experiments, when we do try ourselves to speak worlds, that's the kind of shape those worlds take. Oh, yeah, I agree. I think that uh, suffering should definitely be an option, but I think it should be voluntary suffering. If you had the, the option to choose how much suffering you were going to experience or what kind of world you wanted to live in, you could choose to live in a world exactly like ours as designed by God with all the positives and the negatives. The only difference would be is those people who don't want to live in what they see as a very immoral, painful world, they would have the option to choose to live in one that they would prefer. And that seems like a much more moral outcome. And it seems like no matter what the reason God could have to have any other world, because that would always be an option in this world, because you can choose whatever world you want, then for there can't ever be a reason he couldn't provide this world. Because any benefit is going to be an option. Yeah. I mean, I have to think about that. But I, I mean, one, one thing that occurs to me is that um, a character in a play who chooses not to be part of that play but to, in some sense, be the author um, is not really being a character in a play. Um, if there is going to be an author to the play, and if we are not that author, it's, I don't know, it seems to me that the author making the character into the, the one who does a kind of a choose your own adventure, uh, that, that is to... That is to have a not an author character relationship. 
you know? But wouldn't the author be immoral if they forced the character to go through a lot of suffering they didn't want? Like, wouldn't it be immoral for me to write a character who was a personal being who could experience morality and just have them just experience immense suffering that they never volunteered for against their will? Wouldn't that be horribly immoral? Well, that would that would make every story writer immoral. Um, if they, I, don't, I, I don't think so. I don't, you know, I don't think Shakespeare was immoral for for writing Hamlet. You know, poor Hamlet. But um, you know, the, the Christian version of that story would would be that Shakespeare writes himself into that play in order to to take the tragedy onto himself and to turn it into a comedy and to turn it into a happily ever after. And I think when you're telling that sort of story, um, I, I don't think the morality of Shakespeare is in question at that point. I, I would disagree because I would think that if Shakespeare had the power to actually create living beings who could experience morality and suffering and he deliberately placed them into a story like that, I think that would be incredibly immoral. I think it's not immoral because it's just a story and there's no one actually being hurt by it. But if you could actually write a story that could hurt people, I think that would be immoral to do so. No different than like a gun or shooting someone. No, I don't. Well, yeah, I, I, I disagree. I think, I think if, we are, um, if we are talking about the author of life himself, um, then we are talking about someone with whom we have an asymmetric relationship. Um, we, we do not exist on the same level of being as the author. We, we are characters in the story being told. Um, and I guess if we want to assess the character of the author, we have to take into account the shape of the story and we have to take into account, I think, on Christianity, we have to take into account that he enters into the tragedy to turn it into the comedy and, and offers all characters the happily ever after. Um, but I don't think accusations of immorality work in the same way if we are truly dealing with the author of life. How is that different from slavery? Like if I, if I created some beings to fulfill my desires and my story that they had no say in, how is that different from slavery? Uh, well, for a start, you've got um, characters in the story who are able to relate to the author in this story um, and who are invited by the author who is turned into a character among you into his family, you know. So what this author has done in writing himself into this story is to offer, offer us all something that's far beyond simply being a character in the story, but to be one who is in relationship with the author. Um, that is not, you know, the, it's like the, you know, the master saying to the slave, I'm adopting you into the family. That's, um, that's a different kind of relationship. Well, adopted into the family with cancer and disease and suffering and war and rape and murder and all these other things. So, I mean, it really right. seems to me like if you force someone into a world like this against their will, that is really, really immoral. Like it couldn't be more immoral than to do something that evil. Oh, I don't, I don't see that as evil. Um, so, yeah, there, there is a world uh, full of pain and suffering, a world that God, God himself voluntarily takes on himself. And, and I think it's interesting that when you talk about um, God ought to grant to his creatures the, the kind of the opt-in ability, um, do you want to opt into this story or do you want to opt into a different kind of story? Um, the one in the Christian vision who actually has the opt-in um, ability is God himself. And, and he, he chooses to come in and suffer the most. Um, so, I, I don't see that as immoral, I, you know. That's interesting. Because, yeah, intuitively, it just, it seems, I'm not sure how to explain it, but to me, it seems really immoral to have a being force anyone else into a world without their choosing, without their say-so, without that voluntary option, forcing any involuntary... Life. Yeah, absolutely, and I think life is immoral. I think this world is very immoral. I think right. that from my, like I said, the best of all possible worlds for all possible wills, that would be the moral standard. And that world would be one where every being gets the right to decide for themselves, both the positives and the negatives of the world in which they live. That seems to me to be the objective moral standard. But that is such a different world to anything that we live in, isn't it? I mean, absolutely. Our world is horribly immoral. 
it's yeah it's 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 incredibly fallen and twisted and tragic and full of pain um death and struggle um but therefore the the moral realm that you would wish there to be just it, it actually also seems quite inhuman in that I mean, I came into this world, I had no choice in the matter, I didn't choose my genetic makeup, I didn't choose who I was born to, I didn't choose where I was born. If you were born in Canberra, you wouldn't choose it either. You know, there's, <laughs> there's all these sorts of choices that, that have been denied us as we, as we come into this world. So that if, if morality is sort of dependent on this free-floating individualistic uh, you know, ability to choose X, Y, and Z, you know, in this atopic independent sort of way, I, that just sounds so unlike our human experience. It, it seems like you, ha you almost have to choose between your humanity and, and freedom. Bob, well, couldn't you choose to still be human and just, you could choose to be, live in this world as a human being exactly as it is right now. So I don't see that as a, as really a dichotomy. You can choose both. Yeah. And at what, at what stage would you hope to be able to make this choice? Uh, what do you mean? So you want to get into a, a position where you can, freely, you can freely volunteer for the suffering of this world and that sort of thing. Um, is, is, is that your, I guess I'm trying to get a handle on what, 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 is, this, what is this morality? If, if this world is immoral, how do you actually get to the moral domain that you're talking about? Well, I imagine if we had an all-powerful being, he could have just created it this way. That would be my assumption. Uh, I don't think we can physically make the world to be the objective moral standard. It's a, it's a hypothetical, like an abstract idea. Okay. But I think that if we actually had free will, if there was such a thing, I don't actually believe there is, but if there was such a thing, then an all-powerful being could just say, here, you have free will, decide whatever world you want to live in. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so actually, but that's, that's a completely different universe though. Yes. Def ours is horrible. Ours is immoral. This, the objective moral standard is definitely not our universe. Okay. So where does the pantheism come in, in terms of like, like, wh where is that moral domain? Cause you, you seem to begin by saying that there might be some kind of moral substance in the universe, but, but now you're saying no. Not, oh, not in this anyway. Oh, I'm an atheist, so I don't actually believe in pantheism. I'm just presenting pantheism as an alternative to theism and saying theism yeah. could have an objective morality, pantheism could also have an objective morality, and this, this view of the best of all possible worlds, this is my preferred view of objective morality. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think the idea that freedom involves being... Um, this individual decision-making kind of rational being who can look at the best of all possible worlds and, and, and make choices between uh, various uh, options. I, I just don't think that is what freedom is. Um, and I think there's a, there's a paralysis involved in, in even, you know, attempting to have that as, as your standard of, of, independence or freedom or sovereignty so living kind of living in accordance with your nature seems to be um the closest that we get to freedom um rather than living above your nature being able to choose your nature um i think a more meaningful account of freedom is something like living according to your nature, going with the moral grain of the world, um, rather than somehow standing above the moral grain of the world. Um, which, which is, so that, that, that's where I was talking about the, the danger of having to choose between your humanity and, and freedom. Well, I would say that like uh, right now, if I was given the option, I could just go to my own universe. I'd still be acting in accordance to my, to my nature, so I don't see any conflict with that. But you wouldn't be you anymore. Uh, how so? You, well, you wouldn't be the same you that you are in this universe in, in, in the Why other. Why not? Why would you assume that? Well, I mean, the other universe, I assume, 
um, runs according to different laws and um, you know you you would not have the same web of relationships that makes you you if you're in that other world but it could be like a trip i can go to someone else's house and not be in my house but i'm still me in their house couldn't the universes just be the same uh not really not not if my personal identity is about a web of relationships which i think it is um uh you know, if if you're talking about going through the the wardrobe into Narnia, um, yes, you could you could still be you in Narnia, but but I think if if you're talking about jumping with both feet into a, into an alternative universe, um, then um, yeah, I'm not sure you'd still be you. Oh well, you have the choice to come back, so it would be like the Narnia example. I wouldn't say okay. you just so because the whole point of the my morality is the freedom to choose. So you have the freedom to choose to go to your universe, the freedom to choose to come to this universe, and you can visit other people's universes or make a uh, co collective universe or whatever you want, essentially. Okay. And at that stage, that, yeah, you, you're sounding a lot more like the Christian idea of God. Um, except that the, the Christian idea of God is that he authors a universe and entrust himself wholly to it, no, no, you know, even, even though it has fallen into rack and ruin through human sin, um, he doesn't chuck it in the bin the same way that you or I would. You know, if, if, we, if we happen to you know, make an artwork and it all goes wrong, we chuck it out and, and start again somewhere else. So interestingly, the God of the Bible, having spoken this kind of world into being and, and seeing the hell on earth that it's become, is so committed to it that what he wants to do is enter into it and from the inside out redeem it um, and invite people into it happily ever after. Um, but I just don't, I don't, I think what you are wanting to be is more like an author and less like a character. And I don't think you, you don't have the power, the, the transcendent authority to be an author. All you can be is a character. Um, yeah. Sure, sure. But I see it like I have no problem with the way God, God could in my world, God would have his own universe and he could design whatever he wanted, just like any other being. And he could make the world as fallen as he wanted and he could redeem it and do all of that stuff. The only difference would be is that he couldn't force other beings into that world against their will. And I, that seems to me to be a moral imperative, something that's, that really makes his world evil is that he's forcing all these beings into suffering without their will to me that that just seems really Am really I evil as a, as a father what i've i've brought my daughter into this world was that an evil act uh, I, know she suffer. I i would say no because you didn't have a choice in the world itself you didn't get to design the world if you designed the world to make her suffer and then brought her into it that would be immoral mm-hmm but bringing people into a world of suffering, knowing that they absolutely will suffer. But, you know, I, I, I kind of think life is worth it, you know. Maybe God thinks life is worth it. That could definitely be the case, but it still seems to me that if he really was an all-good, all-powerful God, he would provide us with that life optionally to experience the suffering instead of involuntarily to experience the suffering. It seems if we're going to be contingent beings and not necessary beings, if we're going to be the creatures of this God and not co-creators somehow, um, if he is the author and we are the characters, it, it just, it seems like this is the nature of the case. We, we find ourselves in this kind of world um, and it's full of pain and death and struggle. But, you know, it, it is interesting that suicide rates in the world, while they are worryingly high, especially for certain groups in this world and we want to do everything we can to uh to, to help those who have suicidal feelings um suicide rates are, are not 50 percent, and they're not 90 percent, and they're not 98 percent. um most people most of the time think that life is worth living um you know maybe life is worth it I would say that the same is true of people in slavery. The suicide rate among slaves throughout history wasn't 50% either because they, they value their own life. But that I don't think that makes it justified to make them slaves. If there's a story in which they begin as slaves and then there's a great redemption and they come through the Red Sea and out the other side into, into the land of milk and honey, 
Um, I think that's a that's a story that the world has resonated with for thousands of years. Um, and I, I think that that is, you know, that Exodus story is a kind of a microcosm of the whole biblical story. Um, and like I say, it tends to be the story that every human being who speaks a world into existence tends to speak that kind of story. Um, so I'm not saying this is a, you know, proof of God's existence, but it's, it's, it's some of the categories that I think in when I'm, when I'm thinking about these issues. And you also said, uh, you mentioned us being not necessary beings. Well, couldn't we be contingent beings and God would be the one creating each of our universes just as we wanted them? So we could still be contingent beings and have our own universe without being the necessary being ourselves? So say that again. So so he would create us. So, so God's, the the necessary, God's the necessary being and he just gives us like an Apple iPad and we get to pick our options and just click the apply button and have a universe that God creates. So God is the necessary being. We're all still contingent, but we still get our own universe. It still seems we don't need to be necessary beings for that. I don't think. Contingent beings for that. We don't. So, yeah, I mean, keep it, keep it with, you know, author and character. So he, he writes, I'm Hamlet. He's wrote, written a play for me. And then I, I speak back to Shakespeare and say, uh, Less of the murder, murdering my dad, thanks. And um, can I actually get married and have a happy, happily ever after? Is that is that the kind of the, the illustration? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just, yeah, that's not the relationship of a character to, <laughs> to an author, I guess. Um, the, the extraordinary thing is is not that... You know, it's it's not that the character, you know, decides to be the co-author. It's that the author decides to become a co-character. And and the trajectory of the Bible story is that, yeah, he comes in, takes the tragedy, gives us his comedy. Um, that's, that's the way around he does it. And, you know, if we're talking about God, then by the nature of the case, we are, we are talking about uh, a really radical and fundamental asymmetry going on. Um, and I and I completely understand that uh, from your point of view, you're saying, okay, I'm stepping into that world to look around, that world in which it's all coming from top down. It's all it's all the author telling me the world I want to live in, and I'm concluding that um, this world could not be the the, you know, the the creation of a good God, and therefore this world. I take it that's that's kind of where you're coming from. Um, yeah. That that therefore the author is bad. He, if there is an author to this world, he's totally screwed the pooch. And, and uh, yeah, this this can't be the product of of a grander intelligence. Yeah, exactly. So I see it as more like um, pantheism, where it's just an uncaring universe where we happened to pop into existence. And there, I still think there is an objective morality, but I don't think it's a personal. It is intrinsically personal. It doesn't come mm. from a personal source. Because if it did, I think then there would be that best of all possible worlds. Mm. And what do you, what do you make then of sort of, I, I said that our experience of evil in the world is an experience of the privation of the good. It's, it's something that's been taken away from good. So, you know, disease, health that's been twisted, death is life that's been perverted. Um, family breakdown is loving unity broken apart. Um, does that, does that resonate with you at all that that actually what our experiences of this broken world are our experiences of something good that's been twisted and perverted does, does that at all point you to towards the sort of the the biblical shape of things um not exactly i don't quite understand that analogy because it could just be the case that uh good is the privation of evil and there's really just a giant evil source or an evil god like diestheism and it's the exact opposite of the way we perceive it so i don't i'm not really i don't identify with that analogy except that evil and good uh, are not symmetrical like that at, at all really i mean they're much more like light and darkness you know dark, darkness is not um an equal opposite force to light um you you, you know you, you turn the light switch on and the darkness Darkness must flee. You don't turn the darkness switch on and the light retreats. Um, it is the same way with, with good and evil. Um, it is the same way with life and death. It is the same way with health and disease. Uh, they are not equal opposites. So therefore, good is not a privation of evil. 
that evil is a privation of good. The, the you, ace, people like that. Could you explain that a little bit more? Because in the case of light and dark, we can actually empirically measure the photons, so we know that light is the source of the photons. But how do you know that? Is there is there like a comparative for good and evil, like something we can measure and see? Well, good is actually the source, and it's not actually an evil source. <laughs> Well, think of think of any sort of evil action. Think of betrayal, for instance. Um, betrayal is uh, a, a loving relationship that is then twisted and used for one person's ends. Um, think of think of theft. It, you know, there there is rightful ownership, and there is the violation of that. Think of murder. There is the right to life, and there is the violation of that. So, I, I think it is. I think it's pretty pretty straightforward moral reasoning to say that uh, evil activities are uh, perversions of the good. Mm, that's interesting. Let me let me see if I can uh, work through this. So, if we have another person who I've never interacted with, I can do a moral thing and help them in some way, or I can do an immoral thing and hurt them in some way. And if I have someone who I who I know and um, have a relationship with, I can betray them if they love me. And if I have someone who I have a relationship with where they hate me, I can do something good and make them love me or do moral things for them. So I think there's equal parity on both sides. We can go either way. I don't see any reason to prioritize love as the source. Because mm -hmm. I think for, there's always an inversion equally as applicable in all of those examples. Uh, but but I guess um, uh, yeah, love certainly love described uh, love defined as a kind of a personal connection with somebody who I know. True, because I can always do something moral or immoral to somebody who I've never met before. Um, but love, in in terms of love, says I want you to be. Love says um, you have infinite worth and dignity as another bearer of God's image. And therefore I'm meant to love my neighbor, even if in Jesus example, my neighbor is a Samaritan or whatever. Um, love doesn't necessarily uh, mean I need to be in a relationship with somebody else. But if, if I steal from a total stranger, um, I am violating the rights that I should afford to that person because that, that person deserves infinite, protection and 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 value um as someone loved by god and all that sort of stuff so, so but but theft is a violation of that person's right to property and murder is a violation of that person's right to life um so i i think it is a i think it is a violation of of a good rather than an equal opposite to good so just to try and invert that, uh, we could say there is a really an objective evil source. And anytime you help someone is a violation of their moral right to infinite suffering. <laughs> exactly. Well, and just sit with that term, your moral right to infinite suffering um, just just makes no sense if, if we're if we're using words in their ordinary meanings. Oh yeah, it would probably be like the, your immoral right to absolute suffering or infinite suffering because it's an immoral, evil god. So that would be, I think that would be more accurate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so work that through with me again because it's, it's getting late in the afternoon. All right, so you said that uh, theft is a privation of the right of a person of their rights of ownership. And that's if there's a really good God and, and this good God imparts this moral right of ownership onto us intrinsically. And if there's an evil God and it imports our moral right to suffer, then anytime you help someone, then you are infringing or imposing upon their right to suffer. So mm -hmm. you can just invert the same analogy to show that there could be an evil God uh, who looks at it from the perspective of an absolute evil uh, authority as opposed to a good God who looks at it from the perspective of an absolute good authority. And so the evil gods gives rights to property? Uh, no, it would say you have the right to suffer. And any time you uh, stop someone from suffering, you are infringing on their right to suffer. Right. Right. It would just be a complete inversion of the moral frameworks. It seems like it works equally in both cases. Um, doesn't seem like that to me, but um, I'll have to think it through. Um, So the evil God says that what is good 
is infinite suffering. Well, I'd say he too just call it evil, and he thinks he likes evil. So, so what is good or what is he likes evil, and the evil is suffering. And so, anytime you stop someone from suffering, you would be doing something good, which he would see as bad because he likes the suffering. Um, and I just, I guess, neither of us, I don't think, recognize the vocabulary in, in those sentences as being anything like the vocabulary we use. Ordinarily, you know, that, um, yeah, we would not say that infinite suffering is good. Um, I think that's a, the problem with my level of ability to articulate the point more than the, with uh, the that's actual my, issue. That's my, my fault. I need to, I need to go back over and, and think about it. Hey, we, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, is there anything else you want to, you want to kind of ask me? Oh, there's actually a lot I'd like to ask you, but um, oh, yeah. but I I really I really I'm really interested by the point where you said that you think the story, the author, character analogy. That's really interesting to me. I have to think a lot more about that because from my perspective, that seems immoral, and from your perspective, you think would, would you characterize that as moral, or how would you characterize that as a as a moral relationship between the author and the character? Yes. Yes. That's that's really interesting. I really got to think about that because I've never heard that perspective before. Hmm. Yeah, and and I guess maybe maybe there are some assumptions going on about autonomy as as something that's fundamental um, to the good. It would would that be sort of close close to your heart in terms of that we as moral agents need to be granted autonomy from the outset, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I think that freedom to choice is the as the standard of objective morality from my perspective. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm probably too much of an Augustinian to, <laughs> to 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 go with that. But but yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I've said I've said what I've um, needed to say in, in terms of the author character relationship. Um, yeah. All right. So, do you have to go, or do you have some time for some more questions? Uh, should we do one more? Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Do you have any other arguments or evidences other than the rationality, morality, those kinds of things that you think are good reasons to believe in a God? Uh, I, I just think the person of Jesus, um, in terms of the, the person of the Gospels, um, Jesus Christ, uh, occurs to me as I, I, I love the T.S. Eliot line who said, if God is not like Jesus Christ, he ought to be. Um, and yeah, I mean, for me, it's not that the notion of some kind of deity has gripped my heart, but uh, certainly uh, if God is going to be like Jesus, who is the, he is Shakespeare written into Hamlet to take Hamlet's tragedy on himself, that, that kind of self-giving love seems to me the epitome of what life is and goodness um, is all about. And I remember reading through the gospels as a 21 year old and saying to myself, if God is like Jesus, I'm in. And thinking to myself, uh, okay, uh, you've got me. So the, the person of Jesus um, seems to me to be the sort of person who they would have to be if there was a good author. Um, his kind of suffering love seems to be the sort of action that there would need to be. Uh, if a good God's going to enter into a, a world such as ours. Um, and certainly uh, encountering him in, in that irreducibly existential kind of a way, uh, age 21, is is the reason that I'm a Christian today. I don't see, from my perspective, I see Jesus as just a good guy who existed 2,000 years ago, pretty much. I don't see any reason to extrapolate from that to a divine being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the things that he says about himself, for instance, that he's, he's older than the universe, that he and the Father are one, that if you want to see God, you have to look straight to him, that he is the one who forgives your sins, he'll be the one at the end of all time to, to wrap up history and those sorts of things. Um, you know, if I, I said those things to you, um, you'd probably end the hangout right now and, <laughs> and maybe, maybe seek medical attention for me. But um, it's the sort of thing that Jesus says commonly on page after page, which which just... It, it seems to me, you know, it, 
to, to think that Jesus, I, I often say this to, to people, you know, if you think that Jesus is just a good teacher, it shows that you're not a good listener. Um, the things that he's saying concern his own identity. And I, and I think irreducibly in, in all the Gospels, he, he, he seems to walk around planet Earth like he owns the place. But isn't that true of lots of prophets and mystics throughout time? They all claim to be the divine source and supernatural and have access to divine revelations. I think it, it, it splits into two. Um, there, are, there are either people who are very um, popular and have a lot of power in the world, um, and there are people who make extraordinary claims like, I am God come to earth. Um, Jesus seems to be the intersection on that Venn diagram. Um, and I can't think of someone else who um, insists that he is the unique son of God, older than the universe, the source of life, and who has a following now that numbers in its billions. Um, that, that seems to be a, a, a quite a compelling combination in Jesus. So you think the number of believers is good evidence that it's true? I No, but I, I do think that those who... Uh, have claimed to be uh, the son of God have not been credibly followed um, by, by great numbers. So you, by putting those two, two things together, I think we've got someone who claims to be from this other world and yet who seems to have a real purchase on this world. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing you would expect if there was this son of God mediator kind of person. So if we lived 3,000 years ago, couldn't you say the same thing about Hinduism and the majority religion then? Or if Islam becomes the most popular in the next 100 years or so, couldn't you say the same thing about Islam? Well, I think, interestingly, I mean, the, the deities within Hinduism, it's not like there's a claim that um, Krishna was crucified under Pontius Pilate, um, that he was born when this emperor was emperor and these people were... Um, so the, the claims that those kind of deities have existed in our time and space, it's, it's just not that kind of a claim. It's far more the sort of the dream time claim of uh, Aboriginal Australians, for instance, that there was a dream time and the gods walked the earth, but we're not talking about our time and space. On the other hand, Islam is just uh, very, very much historical and, and uh, Muhammad was very much an historical figure. Um, but he certainly did not claim to be the son of God. He um, would certainly not claim to be that kind of a being. He's very, he very much belongs to our history. So I think, again, I think Hinduism and, and Islam kind of uh, in, in those two Venn diagrams, in, in those two circles, I think that the Hinduism um, speaks of gods, but not in our time and space. And, and Islam speaks of our time and space, but doesn't talk about God coming down. So if there was uh, someone else who came along and claimed to be the son of God and they gathered a large following, would that be evidence that they are, that we should believe them? I think, yeah. If, if someone came in fulfillment of hundreds of uh, ancient prophecies, uh, if he walked on water, healed the sick, raised the dead, and then triumphed over death, and then if the movement that he spawned uh, added to its number every day since then, to the point where you've got two billion people who call him Lord, I, it would at least make me wake up to, okay, let's let's check out this guy, let's 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 see if he's the goods. Interesting. So I don't actually believe any of the miracles are. We should. I don't think we should believe in miracles based on historical testimony. That doesn't seem credible to me. So it seems, from my perspective, that Jesus is just another one of the thousands of prophets who happen to gain popularity, and it happens to just be the most popular at the time or now. And so I don't really see that as a reason to believe it's true. It just seems mm -hmm. like happenstance. I think on the, I mean, on the history and miracles thing, I, I mean, I always love uh, GK Chesterton's line. He says uh, the, uh, the entire order of things is more improbable than any miracle that could be said to violate it. Um, so, you know, I, I often say, you know, uh, I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, but many people believe in the virgin birth of the cosmos and without a virgin. Or I happen to believe that Jesus came to life again in that tomb in Jerusalem, but there are many people who believe that all life originated from non-living matter. Um, and, you know, pick your, pick your miracle. And so for, and so for me, I, I don't think that 
uh, miracles are so much violations of nature or that they cannot be attested to historically. I, I disagree with Hume on that. And um, I, I think you have to, you have to assume that we live in a, in a naturalistic uh, universe. You have to take that as the sort of the null hypothesis and then you have to put the burden of proof on, on those who would claim a, a violation of natural law. I, I, I don't think that's the way things operate. Um, and I, I look at Jesus and I do, I do comparative religion I, and I do compare him to uh, the Buddha and I do compare him to Muhammad. I do com compare him to other uh, worldviews and, and I see him as offering something utterly unique uh, and, and very unlike what the other uh, religious accounts sort of have. So, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a Jesus guy, so that's, that's my burden. So that would, be, that would be the most interesting question I'd like for the last question is that you said you disagree with Hume that we shouldn't, uh, that, we, that it's reasonable to believe miracles based on historical testimony. From my perspective, that it was not because if like, if I told you I saw a unicorn, you shouldn't believe me. But if I told you I saw a dog, you should believe me. The difference between these two claims is that dogs have an implicit empirical basis. There's lots of things about dogs we can use to make tests and measure like their DNA, their bones, fossils, and all those kinds of things. And none of that exists for unicorns. So it seems to me that testimony is only sufficient to indicate things that we already have an empirical basis for, which would exclude miracles, magic, mythical creatures, the paranormal, the supernatural, or UFOs, those kinds of things. And so I don't think it's reasonable to believe in any of those based on testimony alone until you have an empirical basis for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is an assumption there built into that that, that um, we must be empiricists from the outset. Uh, no, I would say that we can dis we can distinguish between there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. Like if I imagine a unicorn, I don't actually see a unicorn. Mm -hmm. So, and we know that's not an assumption. We can actually demonstrate that. And so we need some kind of a method to differentiate between things in our imagination and things in our experience. So that's not a given, that's what we can actually demonstrate. And mm -hmm. I would say we have to, whatever method we decide upon, we have to apply that method to testimony of miracles and all these other things. And mm -hmm. the, the method I use is empiricism. Yeah. And therefore, what is plausible and implausible, you've already got an understanding of what's plausible and impl implausible. Um, in all that and is does this sort of go together with Carl Sagan's you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof sort of thing um yeah so it would be a more specific version of uh empirical claims require empirical evidence and conceptual claims require conceptual evidence okay um and i guess it, it's all about what you're expecting um it's it's all about what you what you already find plausible so if you if you think of the universe as pretty much a closed system, and if you even conceptualize miracles as a violation of the laws of nature, um, you've, you've already got uh, a plausibility structure for how you're going to view stuff that happens in the world. And that plausibility structure, you know, it, it, it might, it might be a good way of, of, of looking at, at, at certain things. Um, it might not be, but I think if we live in a universe in which, like I began with, we are rational beings having a rational conversation using emo emotion and logic and uh, language and uh, if we are living these personal lives in a, in a personal world, um, then to have uh, the source of those things show up in the midst of time and space in order to say, uh, I, I do indeed love you. I am here for you. Um, that, that is not from my perspective. Once, when, once you have a kind of a, a Christian worldview to have such a God show up in time and space, um, and to be greater than the regularities of this world, um, is not an impossibility and it's not um it's not something that that makes me raise my skepticism sky high it's something that that i'm a lot more open to but i'm open to it because of my prior worldview commitments and and i would say that you are close to it because of your prior worldview commitments um 
so it can't just be a matter of empirically checking the data because we've all, all always got these larger assumptions going on in the background. Oh, yeah, I agree. I don't want to, lar the larger assumptions would definitely be a bad place for me to start. So my starting position is, is that we have, we have an imagination, we have an experience, and there's some difference between these two things. And we have to determine, is any claim of I saw a miracle, the something that actually was experienced, or was it just something in their imagination? We need some criteria to differentiate between these two. And the fact that they said it, their testimony doesn't seem to be able to do that on its own. You need something else in addition to that. And the something else for me is empiricism. And based on empiricism, it doesn't seem like any testimony on its own is reasonable to believe for anything that doesn't have an empirical basis. So what is your criteria to filter out the imaginary things to be able to indicate that the testimony of miracles actually was an experienced thing in the world? I mean, one thing you can do is, is this the sort of thing that they would want to make up? Is this the sort of thing that would benefit them uh, to imagine? Is this the sort of thing that, it, that is already um, within their conceptual worldview? And, and, and things about the resurrection um, are interesting, you know, were they really expecting a resurrection in the middle of history, the way that the New Testament, you know, attests that there, there was one? Was this something that they benefited from? Well, no, actually, you know, as they held to their story of, of a resurrection, it, it cost them and some cost some of them their lives. Um, so that, there are there are ways of pushing back against um, the imagination um, kind of hypothesis that, that it is just imagined and was not experienced. Um, but, you know, there are hundreds of millions of people on Earth today who um, claim to have experienced something of the miraculous, um, hundreds of millions of them. And is, is there a threshold of, of, of evidence that you would have before you'd start to think such things are, are possible? Well, I would need to be make empirical predictions for me. It wouldn't be there wouldn't no, be no amount of eyewitness testimony that would be compelling to me. For example, you can there's thousands of eyewitness testimonies of UFOs and the Loch Ness monster, and there's tens of thousands of like uh, homeopathy, especially in London. I believe there's a lot of big homeopathy market, and there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of magic and Wicca and spiritual experiences from all different races and religions, and and there's Every human being, if I showed you a picture of an optical illusion, would see it as appear as if it was moving. So the number of eyewitnesses doesn't seem to be able to distinguish between is this just something in our head and is this something mm -hmm. really in the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and yet you would take as credible um, certain other occurrences that people would testify to that are extraordinary and weren't what people were expecting. I mean, in the scientific realm, you're almost, you're trying to get those, aren't you? You're, you're trying to, you know, falsify your, your hypothesis. You're, you're, you're trying to get the surprising results. Um, so there are all sorts of surprising, extraordinary things that you do believe on the basis of, of, uh, of testimony. Absolutely. If it can make testable, repeatable predictions, but it's not the testimony alone. It's the repeatable predictions part. Yeah, unfortunately, history is not <laughs> not, uh, not repeatable. But um, yeah, I mean, it it does come down to who you think Jesus is. I, I think if if Jesus is the author of life, then I think it would be extraordinary if he didn't rise from the dead. Um, but you know that that just goes to show how worldviews and prior assumptions feed into um, how we then look at the evidence. But uh, yeah, I've got to go and pick up my daughter. All right. Uh, thanks for talking with me. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. I hope we can do this again sometime. Yeah, no, I'd really love to. Really loved it, Tom. All right, cool. Well, I'll let you go. I'll see you later. Brilliant. Okay, we'll catch up later. See you. Bye-bye.